Hello and welcome to lecture number one. Today's topic will be the origins of the United States Constitution. There are three main themes to be addressed in this presentation. Initially, we'll discuss the first Constitution of the United States and some of its problems. Next, we'll explore some of the background of the Constitutional Convention, um, dealing with some of the problems that they were facing as well as some of the important people who were there. Finally, the big takeaway is that there were many controversies, yet they were resolved through compromise at the Constitutional Convention. That will kind of be the core of today's topic. So I'd like to begin by talking about the first Constitution of the United States and some of its problems. This map identifies the land included in the original 13 states and territories at the end of the American Revolution. Notice the area in pink on the right, the eastern seaboard. Well, those included the first 13 colonies that eventually became states. U.S. territory actually expanded all the way to the Mississippi River, as you see with the arrows and the second circle. In order to provide enough unity for those 13 colonies that were fighting to become states, they got together and they developed the first Constitution of the United States. The name of that Constitution? was the Articles of Confederation. We'll explore some of the problems associated with the Articles next. While the Articles provided enough unity for the colonies to defeat the mighty British Empire, there were some problems associated with it. First of all, each state, when it came to passing legislation, had one vote, regardless of its size or its population. Let me show you on the next slide. Each individual state had a lot of power under the Articles. One state had one vote. So this meant that a large state like Virginia, with a population of about 750,000 people, had as much political power and clout, so to speak, as a state like Delaware, with only 60,000 people. Was this going to be a nation based upon the power of the people or the power of individual states? There were some apparent additional problems with the Articles. Secondly, um, there was neither an executive nor a judicial branch. Essentially, there was only one branch of government, the legislative branch, and there was a national Congress. Finally, states had a tremendous amount of power, as mentioned earlier. Some of the powers that they had was to coin their own money and even conduct their own foreign policy. States were allowed to levy taxes, but the national government did not. Well, let me try to explain in the next slide uh, some issues with taxation. I don't know anyone who likes to pay taxes, but our tax dollars go toward a range of things. On the left, we see an image of George Washington at Valley Forge. During the Revolutionary War, one of the problems he continually faced was a lack of funding for things like uniforms, boots, things like that for his soldiers. On the right, we see some currency from the state of South Carolina. If you go to Europe, you use the euro. If you go to Mexico, they use pesos. In the United States, there were multiple currencies. There was South Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania. Each state had its own currency. It created chaos for business owners. Taken collectively, these range of problems with the articles prompted some to want to try to modify those articles or maybe even start from scratch. The fancy name for the meeting in order to get together to try to modify the Articles of Confederation is called the Constitutional Convention. Delegates met in 1787. I'll talk about that next. Do you know where they met for the Constitutional Convention? It was in the nation's largest city, Philadelphia. The name of the building was Independence Hall. It's shown here in the image. One of the things I'll point out would be the division among the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, but there was one philosophy or one idea that united all of them. They wanted to establish a republic. Here's a one-sentence textbook definition of a republic. It's when eligible citizens elect people or representatives who make decisions and establish policies for them. In the United States, we live in a type of a democracy. The type of democracy is a republic. 
there were 55 delegates from several states who attended meetings in Philadelphia. We're not going to talk about all of them, but I would like to highlight some of the important individuals who shaped the discussions at the Constitutional Convention. This painting represents some of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Some people have argued that the so-called greatest minds in American history were among the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Probably the most famous American among the American people is shown here. George Washington. He was the head of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War that defeated the mighty British Empire. One of the first decisions made by the delegates to the convention was to have Washington preside over their meetings each day as chair. The oldest delegate to the Constitutional Convention was over 80 years old. It was Ben Franklin. During the war, he had served as a diplomat and successfully was able to get the French to fight on behalf of the colonies. On the right, we see someone else. He was only 36 years old and is somewhat underrated as a political figure. His name was James Madison, a Virginia politician. If there were only 55 delegates, all of whom were white men at the Constitutional Convention, there were plenty of people who were not there. However, I did want to point out one. He's shown here, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson wasn't even in the country during the Constitutional Convention. The individual who was recognized as the so-called father or author of the Constitution was James Madison. We'll explore some of the reasons why he's considered to have such an important role next. Next, we'll explore some of the controversies and how they were resolved through compromise at the Constitutional Convention. The first dealt with how each state would be represented in Congress. Madison's Virginia plan set the stage for one of the first controversies. Interestingly though, uh, the first two provisions of it were actually accepted by everyone. First of all, he called for the elimination of the Articles of Confederation. He said there were so many problems with the Articles, they had to start from scratch, and that was accepted. Secondly, he argued that the national government should be divided into three branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial. Here we see kind of a visual representation of this separation of powers. Madison argued that the legislative branch should be the most powerful of the three branches. While those first two proposals met with approval by the delegates to the convention, Madison's third main idea was very controversial. He argued that representation in the legislative branch should be determined entirely by each state's population. Here we can go back to that visual representation. Um, Madison's idea here, if to put it another way, is the number of representatives for each state would be determined entirely by each state's population. As you might suspect, the big states thought this was a good idea, but individuals from small states disagreed wholeheartedly. They would lose a lot of power under this new system. The success of the convention was threatened by the issue of how each state would be represented, bigger, small. Finally, cooler heads prevailed uh, when the oldest delegate, Benjamin Franklin, developed a compromise, or at least support for what came to be known as the Great Compromise. It actually accepted much of Madison's Virginia plan, but it had a key distinction. It separated the legislative branch into two different chambers. The upper chamber would be the Senate, and every state would be treated equally. There would be two senators for each state. In the House of Representatives, the number would be determined by each state's population. This struck a balance between the big and the small states. The big states liked the makeup of the House of Representatives. The small states liked the Senate. Again, here we see that visual representation uh, of separation of powers and the Great Compromise. The legislative branch was divided into the House and Senate. The number of representatives for each state was based entirely on a state's population, and this made people from the large states happy. 
I'd like to jump ahead to current events just a little bit. We have a census every 10 years, and these days, each member of Congress represents a district of about 700,000 people. Today, Michigan has 14 members of the House of Representatives. We're a fairly large state. I'd like to offer a quick update based upon the most recent census. In 2020, we had a census and Michigan was growing at a slower pace as compared to other states. So, beginning in January of 2023, Michigan will lose one of its members of Congress. It will go from 14 members of the House of Representatives to 13, and when the new census information is put into place, each district will then represent about 750,000 people. Again, each state is treated equally in the United States Senate. Each state, whether it's in the north, the south, large or small, has two senators. The topic of slavery also divided delegates to the Constitutional Convention. The controversy dealing with slavery wasn't whether or not slavery should be protected in the Constitution, unfortunately. Instead, it was, well, how would they count slaves when determining each state's population? Here we are back at the original 13 states and territories. That red line indicates an area where south of that, slaves made up a large portion of the population because they played a crucial role in the south's economy. Slaves made up a large percentage of the population of many southern states. Representatives from those states would not even consider the elimination of slavery. But what they wanted to know was, well, how should we count slaves when determining each state's population? How to count slaves was important because it determined the number of members of the House of Representatives for each state. That's why this was so controversial. Rather than be, this being a disagreement between the big and the small states, Instead, this issue of slavery divided northern and southern states. Once again, the future of the country and the future of the convention was threatened. The issue of slavery, too, was resolved by compromise. 55 of the so-called greatest minds in American history decided that when determining a state's population, one slave was equal to three-fifths of a person. Yeah, so-called greatest minds in American history. The issue of slavery would continue to divide the country until the Civil War of the 1860s. What was clear was that the delegates to the convention actually were embarrassed by their protection of slavery. The word slave does not appear in the Constitution. At one point, the word other persons, uh, def clearly referring to slaves, um, appears in the Constitution as well as the phrase servant. Unfortunately, the Constitution actually justified and protected slavery. The last controversy I'd like to address dealt with electing the President of the United States, and it resulted in the creation of the Electoral College. There were lots of questions dealing with the chief executive. What should they call this person? How long should the length of term be? How many should there be? Should there be two presidents? Should there be three? Should there just be one? There were lots and lots of questions. Eventually, they decided to choose only one president, and that individual would be elected for one four-year term. But still, there were lots of questions about how to choose this individual. Some argued that the American people or voters should directly elect this president. Others said, no, it should be members of the House or the Senate. Eventually, they chose something unique. They decided to create something called the Electoral College. I'd like to talk next about how the Electoral College works. There are two key concepts I'd like to address when it comes to explaining how the Electoral College works. First, in order to win a presidential election, a candidate must win a majority of electoral votes. The magic number, so to speak, these days is 270. 
Well, how do we get this number of 270? Well, I'll try to show. First of all, we start with the number 435. That's the number of members of the House of Representatives. Then you add 100 because that's the total number of members of the Senate. Then you add three because Washington DC is not a state, but it's treated like a state when it comes to a presidential election. The total number of electoral votes available is 538. A majority or over half of 538 is 270. So that's where we get the number of 270 electoral votes that a candidate needs in order to win the presidency. You might say, okay, I can memorize that. That's fine and dandy. But how does a person win electoral votes? Well, that's the second key concept. The candidate who wins the most popular votes in an individual state wins all of that state's pledged electoral votes. Let's think of it this way. Rather than having one election on a Tuesday in November every four years for president, essentially what we have are 51 elections, one in every state plus Washington, D.C., because that's how those electoral votes are handed out. They're handed out on a state by state basis. Let's use Michigan as an example to try to explain this whole thing. First of all, let's look at the number of members of the House of Representatives for Michigan. Well, based upon the latest census, it's 14. Michigan also has two U.S. Senators. That means Michigan has 16 electoral votes. No worries, do not memorize this chart, but I just wanted to point out how the number of electoral votes are distributed among different states. First of all, you see Alaska there. Alaska is a small state with only three electoral votes. California is the largest state with 55 electoral votes. It's the largest state in terms of population. Notice Florida. Based upon the different census results from 2000 and 2010, Florida's number of electoral votes went from 27 to 29. Finally, we see Michigan. Michigan used to have 17 electoral votes, but people tended to leave Michigan, and so Michigan today only has 16 electoral votes. Again, here we see some other comparisons on this distribution of electoral votes. New York used to be the largest state in the union. Now it only has 29 electoral votes. Ohio used to be larger as well. It has 18 electoral votes. Now look at Texas. More people have been moving into Texas than any other state the last oh, 20 years or so. Texas went from 34 to 38 electoral votes. Again, this is all based upon each state's population. So what happened in Michigan in the fall of 2020? Well, Joe Biden took the state of Michigan in a pretty close election. He won with 50.6% of the popular vote. Because Joe Biden won the state of Michigan, he received all 16 of Michigan's electoral votes. The data here shows the national results from the 2020 election. Joe Biden eventually won 306 electoral votes to President Trump's 232. Voter turnout in 2020 was very high, at about 66.7% of eligible voters actually voting in the 2020 election. Here we see that electoral map again. The blue states on this map identify states won by Joe Biden. Notice that he had strong support in the far west, the Great Lakes, as well as the Northeast. Donald Trump had strong support in the American South, the Great Plains, and the Intermountain West. Here we see another recent presidential election result set of data. In 2016, President Trump clearly won the presidency with 306 electoral votes to Hillary Clinton's 232. However, the popular vote was different. 
Clinton actually received three million more popular votes by average Americans um, uh, than President Trump did. Uh, this is rare, but it has happened uh, at other times in American history. When exploring other presidential elections, this has happened sometimes in the past. So for example, in the year 2000, Al Gore received about a half a million more popular votes by the American people than George W. Bush, yet George W. Bush clearly won over half of the electoral vote. This also happened in 1888. Uh, at that time, there were fewer states, so a majority of electoral votes was 206. Benjamin Harrison clearly won a majority with 233, yet Grover Cleveland won the popular vote. Once officials in each state have certified the results in that state, they send them off to Congress, and then Congress meets in early January to count the electoral votes submitted from each state. In general, this is a simple formality. However, in January of 2021, they had some problems. Just as members of Congress were in the act of actually certifying the election, and following a speech by President Trump, a group of Trump supporters stormed the United States Capitol, overran the police, and occupied the Capitol. This brought uh, the count to a halt for a time, but that was only temporary. Uh, eventually that evening, uh, they finished counting the vote. It was actually the next morning. Um, the uh, officials, Democrats as well as Republicans, described these events as an insurrection, a violent assault by a mob, and a major rebellion. This was the first time the United States Capitol had been overrun in such a way since the War of 1812 when the British did it. There were a range of claims of election fraud in 2020 and between 55 and 65 court cases. And in each case, those allegations of fraud were struck down and each state certified the elections in ultimately ulti uh, in Joe Biden's favor. A group of national security experts came to the conclusion that quote, that the election was quote, the most secure in American history. We see one of these allegations of voter fraud locally. Hamlin Township is located just uh, north of, of Ludington, and the Hamlin Township clerk ended up getting harassed from people all over the country because one voter was identified as being born January 1st, 1901. Well, what happened is when they took the voter data that was originally in print and they digitized it, the one voter's birthday was blank and it went to the default of January 1st, 1901. Theoretically, she was 119 years old. Well, in fact, the person who's, who was recorded as being 119 years old was only 75 and the clerk had actually double checked this uh, and made sure that the proper person was voting in the election. It's just an example of some of the claims of voter fraud in 2020, yet these security experts, as well as the Attorney General of the United States, who was appointed by President Trump, declared that there were no widespread uh, examples of voter fraud in 2020. Now, earlier in the lecture, I said, in order to win a presidential election, a candidate must win a majority of electoral votes. Well, what if there are a whole bunch of people who run for president and no one wins a majority? Well, the Constitution has a solution. The United States House of Representatives would pick the next president among the top three finishers in electoral votes. The House of Representatives has had to take these steps. In 1824, there were four candidates running for the presidency. At that time, we had fewer states. So in order to win a majority of electoral votes, a candidate had to garner 131. Well, you can see that the most electoral votes won were by Andrew Jackson at 99. And 99 is less than 131. 
So the House of Representatives convened and they had to pick the next president. Eventually, they chose John Quincy Adams. Now you might be saying, well, what happened then? Well, uh, it caused quite a controversy. And if you'd like to learn more about that, maybe you can take my US history class before, up to 1877. You can learn about a big controversy in American history there. Well, hopefully that explanation wasn't too confusing. I did have a couple of concluding remarks. To sum up some of the key ideas from this lecture, first of all, the Articles of Confederation was the name of the first constitution of the United States. You should also be able to identify some of the key individuals who shaped events at the Constitutional Convention. And finally, you should be able to explain three controversies from the convention itself and evaluate which you think was the most important. Well, that ends the first lecture for our class. I hope you learned something new and we'll see you online. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.